you to take your Bible, if you do have one, and go to Proverbs chapter 27. Proverbs chapter 27 this morning. Thank you, Brother Dan, Brother Nathan, musicians, for all the work that you do this morning. And um, it's good to see you. Hope you're going well. Proverbs 27. And uh, I'd like to read just a single verse here this morning. All right, let's read verse 23, shall we? The Bible says, Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks, and look well to thy herds. Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks, and look well to thy herds. Let's pray. Now, Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to meet in this place. We commit this time to you now, and thank you for the scriptures that they're able to build us up, they're able to help us, and Father, if we just let them have the effect that they need to have, pray that the Holy Spirit might be our teacher. There's nothing that I can say, Lord, that would be of any help. But if your word is preached, then it can be a help and a blessing to your people. So we have confidence in the scriptures and we ask that you'd bless the time as you see fit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this passage is dealing specifically with a farmer um, who is instructed to take care to know the state of his flocks and to look well to his herds. I don't believe, I could be mistaken, but I don't believe any of us have any sheep or goats um, this morning. But in a, an agricultural society, how important it would be to make sure that your sheep are well, and that your flocks are going well, and that they are your source of prosperity and, and really maintaining your own provision for your home, your family. So, so this is very practical for a farmer, and, and I, I don't want to take away from that. But I'd like to use this verse to draw out a principle, draw out a principle here that we could use. And, and it's this principle that we have a personal responsibility to, to know our condition, to understand our state. It's our responsibility to do that. The Bible says, know the state of thy flocks and look well to thy herds. So to do that, I'd like to do three things. I'd just like to develop the thought from these verse, this verse, these verses here this morning. I'd like to look at an example or two in Scripture if we've got the time. And then finally, I'd like us to finish by looking at the best state of man, the best state of man. And so do, do, do stay with me as we go through this. Um, first of all, just notice the thought, verses 23 to 27. I'm going to read the entire passage. Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks, and look well to thy herds. For riches are not forever, and doth the crown endure to every generation." The hay appeareth, and the tender grass showeth itself, and herbs of the mountains are gathered. The lambs are for thy clothing, and the goats are the price of the field. And thou shalt have goat's milk enough for thy food, for the food of thy household, and for the maintenance for thy maidens. Look at verse 23. Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks. And I, I see, first of all, an attitude. The approach that we would have with this matter is a diligent approach. A diligent attitude. Be thou diligent. We must approach this matter with diligence. The word diligence means steady application in business of any kind. Uh, it's constant effort to accomplish what is undertaken. Exerting your body or mind without unnecessary delay or sloth. Uh, it's due attention. It's industry. We need to take this matter seriously. Would you agree that we do have the tendency to become a little bit comfortable and complacent and uh, careless about things? Uh, it's in our nature to let down our guard, especially when life is going smoothly. Um, sometimes in trials and troubles, we, we tend to seek the Lord a bit more carefully. And uh, when, when life is not like that, we can be careless. We can become complacent. And so in Australia, as we do say too often, a she'll be right attitude will not do. It won't just be right. Your condition of your heart will not just be all right. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. You know what comes out of your life are the issues of life. The things that you think, the motives of your heart, the, the words that you say, and, and really by extension to that, it's your habits, it's your pattern of life, it's the way you live your life. When people look at your life, they can't see your heart, but what they can see is what comes out of your heart. And the Bible says, keep thy heart with all diligence. A she'll be right attitude will not work in this matter. So I see the attitude. I, I see, secondly, the responsibility. 
Uh, look there at verse 23 once again. Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks. The responsibility is to know the state, to know the condition, to understand the circumstances of that thing. The word know, I mean, we use it all the time, but just by way of definition, to perceive with certainty, to understand clearly, to have a clear and certain perception of truth, fact, or anything that actually exists. You know, we would say this, that this man is well known to us. He's, we're familiar with him. So when you, when you know something, it's not strange to you. It's not something that you're not familiar with. And I'd like to ask you this question. Do, do you know the state of your heart? Do you know the state of where you're at, your condition before the Lord, or do you just think you know? Um, the reason I ask that is a couple of reasons. Well, first of all, we tend to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. Uh, we tend to look at ourselves and make excuses and justification for why we do what we do. Oh, it's okay because of this reason in my life, and God will excuse it. We tend to think more highly than we ought to think. But the Bible says to think soberly and uh, with a sound mind. Jeremiah also is another reason. Jeremiah 17, verse 9 and 10, you know this verse. The heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? We, we can't know our own heart. We have to have the Lord to genuinely search our heart. Um, so the Bible says in verse 10 there, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Jesus Christ, um, on his way to Jerusalem, um, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. He passed through Samaria and uh, they, they didn't receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. And the disciples said, should we call down fire and just burn these people up? And, and Jesus had to turn and rebuke them. And he said to them in Luke chapter 9, verse 55, he said, "Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. If we're not careful, we can have a spirit about things and we, we can't even be honest before the Lord and say that I know my own spirit. This is for the Lord to tell us that if we want a genuine understanding and we want to really know our state, our condition, we have to have the Lord's help. So we're told to know the state. And I'd just like to say this, that the state is something that can change over time. If any of you have a medical condition, it's not really generally the case that you can go to a doctor and you can do a blood test and you can do a, an ultrasound or whatever it is you might need to do and, and then if you have a condition that's chronic that that would be enough. Rather you have to go back again and again. You got to keep checking. You got to keep checking in on how things are going and this is true for our heart. We've got to keep checking the state of our heart. Um, the state is the condition. It's the circumstances of something at any given time. And so those circumstances would be internal, um, but they also could be relating to somebody else or something else. So we would say this, the body is in a sound state or has just recovered from a feeble state, so a feeble condition. And you could say that the state of your health is good or the state of your mind is favorable for study. Uh, or, or we say that somebody is in a single state or he's in a married state. So it's the condition. And just simply that what is the condition of your heart this morning? That's really the question I'd like you to be thinking about as a believer. What is the condition of your heart? What is your state this morning? Um, the Bible says, know the state. And I know that that's talking to a farmer, but I'd like to draw that principle that we need to know the state of our heart. And then we look at the scope, third of all. So um, back in the verse 23, be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks and look well to thy herds. You believe that every word in the Bible is there for a reason. It's not a responsibility that I have to look at somebody else's state. And this is the state of thy flocks, thy herds. This is for me. This is for you individually as a person. Uh, this is something that you've got to do for yourself. Uh, this is a personal responsibility. Uh, we're so good at minding somebody else's business. We're so good at uh, understanding what's happening in somebody else's life and making a judgment about that. And, and there is a call for discernment and we should uh, be able to look at a situation and scripturally understand what, what's happening. But, but this, uh, this matter of the state of your heart, well, this is something that you would do for you. Um, I would like to say that if you've got someone who has the rule over you, then they are watching 
for your soul. Um, we read that in Hebrews. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. Why? For they watch for your souls. As they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that is unprofitable for you. So I can say that Pastor Bayer does watch for our souls. That's his responsibility as an under-shepherd of this church. He's, he's looking at our lives and, and he's the first person to say that he won't meddle in areas of, his, of our lives that he does not believe are under his jurisdiction, right? And so we're, we're grateful for that. But he's still watching. And that's not a bad thing or something to be scared about. This is something that will help us. If we allow that to help us to walk with the Lord better, we will have a better accounting and Pastor Bayer will have a better accounting one day, which will give him joy. He doesn't want to be able to go at that judgment day and, and talk about um, someone that was in, under his care and he's, he's watching and, and they just refuse to, to heed his counsel and they refuse to listen to his preaching and that'll, that'll, be, that'll be with grief. The Bible says that that's an accounting that's with grief, not, not profitable for, for you. Uh, in fact, we, we know that in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, Paul charges the, the elders at Ephesus to take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. And he said to those men, he said, take heed to yourselves, number one. But then he said, take heed to all the flock. And a pastor that's doing his job properly is going to do that. He's going to take heed to himself, but he also will be looking and, and watching and seeing the state of the flock. It's just a natural thing that an under-shepherd will need to do. So how does this relate to us? Because we're not pastoring, right? Um, so, so we're individuals walking before the Lord. Um, we have a responsibility that when pastor is preaching the Bible and what he preaches is consistent with the scriptures, that we don't reject that that we do receive that. Uh, Pastor Bayer can give us good messages week in, week out, but he can't make us respond to it. He can give us good preaching and teaching Wednesday nights, and he is, but it's on us to respond. It's on us to obey. It's on us to submit ourselves to the Word of God. Pastor Bayer can't do that. So let me submit to you, it's your choice if you'll receive his preaching and counsel. As we think about the scope of this matter, obviously it's for ourselves primarily. So this morning, as an individual standing before the Lord, you need to know the state of your own heart. Truly it is me, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Um, Jesus did warn us in Matthew chapter 7, uh, Why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. And that really just comes back to our tendency as humans, isn't it? We can, we're the first to spot something wrong with someone else. And uh, that's our tendency. But if we're honest and we look at our heart and we ask the Lord to look at our heart and diagnose where we're at, man, there could well be something much bigger in our lives than what we can see in somebody else. So, as a husband, um, Pastor Bayer talked about headship um, over the last couple of weeks. And as a husband over a wife, there's an amount of care and responsibility that you would have. You'd have a role in doing this for your wife to, to know her state, understand where she's at and to help her ultimately to have a better judgment seat of Christ one day. But if you have children under your headship, then you would do this for them as well. Um, I don't have... Well, we have a child on the way, but we don't have children physically in our home right at this very moment. And uh, so I don't exactly know what all this means. But uh, growing up, you know, mum and dad would check in on us. It's one thing to go, go in a Christian home and try and live a certain way. Mum and dad would sit down and have a chat. Hey, how are you going? How are things? And that's a good thing as a parent to do that. Check in with your children. How are they going? How is their heart? You may not be able to force a certain way or a certain direction, but you have a responsibility to be caring for the state of those under your leadership. Apply that to a work relationship. Don't, don't limit the Bible just to a matter of a church thing. The Bible affects every area of our life. If you are a leader or a manager in a workplace, man, you have a responsibility to know the state of those people that are under your condition, under your responsibility. You, you would want them to know how they're going and you want to know how they're going so you can get better 
productivity and better efficiency and so forth and help them. Um, but let's bring it back to ministry. So if you're a leader of a Sunday school, hey, you'd want to care for those under your leadership. Be concerned about the state of those under your instruction. You know, the Sunday school class isn't just limited necessarily to Sunday morning teaching. There can be some care and some concern that goes outside of the classroom, amen? And I'm um, thankful for my wife who encouraged me in that way. Um, this is, by the way, this is limited to some relationships. Um, this is not a free-for-all where we have purview to just go around and um, knowing everything about everyone else. Uh, we don't need to be the Holy Spirit in somebody else's life. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians, if you will. 1 Thessalonians, just to um, look at some guardrails that we would have when it comes to this matter. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians 4. <clears throat> Bible says, But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. So the Holy Spirit is giving us this scripture here, and he's using Paul the penman to write to the church at Thessalonica, and he says to them, I don't need to tell you about brotherly love because you already know how to do that. God taught you how to love one another. But he just exhorts them to increase in that. Verse 10, Indeed, you do it toward all the brethren, which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. What's he saying? He's saying, brethren, I want you to abound in love, increase in love more and more towards the brethren. And then he says in verse 11, that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you that you may walk honestly toward them that are without and that you may have lack of nothing. Just right on the heels of telling them to have brotherly love, which is concern and care and so forth for others, he says to them, but I want you to study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Um, go to 2 Thessalonians, just the next book. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. This is the reason why you had to say this in the first book, because there's a bit of a problem in this church of busy bodies. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse number 11. Let's, let's pick up verse 10, if we will. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now, them that are such we command and exhort you by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. So this is a bit of an error that had come into this church as they waited for the return of the Lord and they kind of gave up their jobs and started meddling in other people's business. And the word busybody means a meddling person, one who concerns himself with the affairs of others, but with too much forwardness. It's one thing to come alongside a brother and say, hey, how are you going? But, but that doesn't need to extend sometimes much more than that. Sometimes you just need to mind your own business. And we all appreciate that, right? But at the same time, there should be some brotherly love. So I'm just talking about some guardrails that would guide this. Uh, 1 Timothy, we're right next to that book as well. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse number uh, 11. First Timothy 5, 11, the scripture says, But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith and with all they learn to be idle wandering about from house to house and not only idle but tattlers also and busybodies speaking things which they ought not and so guardrails about caring for somebody would come down to this that hey if you've got someone under your headship that's where it begins it really begins with you but then if you've got someone under your headship a wife or children then that would be your responsibility ministry would also be another example but as far as it relates to others um, we've got to be so careful not to be meddling with other people's matters. And idleness will feed that. And so it's just good to be busy doing what God called you to do. Amen. So we see the, uh, the instruction given that we need to know the state. The attitude is to be diligent. The scope is thy flocks and thy herds. Fourthly, um, if you come back to Proverbs with me, Proverbs 27 once again. 
we see here the reason why we should care about this. Proverbs 27 and verse 23 says, Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks and look well to thy herds. Notice verse 24. For riches are not forever, and doth the crown endure to every generation. Be diligent to know the state of thy flocks and look well to thy herds because riches have a way of just coming to an end. The Bible talks about riches as those things that fly away towards heaven. They make themselves wings, riches. And uh, we, we have to understand something here that, that there's a tendency with things to just come to an end. There's no guarantee, is there? Um, might be in a good job right now, but it's quite easy to lose that job uh, if the Lord lets that happen. Um, or maybe our own foolishness sometimes might bring that about. The tendency of things in our lives to slip, to deteriorate, to digress, to go backwards. Uh, those of you that are scientifically minded, you understand the laws of thermodynamics. And the second law of thermodynamics uh, is this, that entropy increases over time in a closed system. And what is that word entropy? Caleb, am I saying that correctly? I think I am. I think so. We'll go and check that later. Entropy is a measure of the randomness or disorder in a system. You have a closed system. What happens over time is that randomness increases. Disorder increases. So apply that to your heart. Over time, our tendency is to become a bit careless, to, to let down our guard, to, to be less watchful about things. And there is no guarantee that we're sitting in church this morning and we have our Bibles open. But by the grace of God, we might not be doing that this time next year. If the Lord tarries, what's going to keep you focused and faithful to what he called you to do? We, we should uh, be very, very careful. How are we? How is our state? How is our true condition? Um, it's not the natural state of the flesh to get better. Um, and as long as you're in this body, you're going to have a flesh nature to deal with. Um, in the same chapter, let's look at verse number 8, Proverbs 27, verse number 8. As a bird that wandereth from her nest, so is a man that wandereth from his place. When a man wanders from his place, he, he loses that direction, that purpose that he should have. And those that are under his leadership and protection will suffer as a result. A mother bird that leaves her eggs and leaves the nest, those chicks are going to struggle. They're not going to survive. A man that wanders from his place has an effect on him, but it has an effect on those under him. So stay in your place. Know your place, number one. And then stay in that place. Be faithful. Be consistent. And we, we sang this song in the Sunday school hour that we are prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. And daily, weekly and monthly, man, we need to be asking the Lord, help me to walk with you. Help me to stay faithful to those things you've given me to do. And our hearts, if we're not careful, will tend to wander away from the Bible, away from the truth tend to wander away from church and tend to wander away from our place that God's given us. Um, so how do I wrap that thought up? Well, Psalm 139, if you'd like to turn there. Psalm 139, this really is the approach, the prayer, the desire of our honest heart before the Lord if we would like to apply this. Psalm 139, the Holy Spirit gave us this verse, 23 and 24. Uh, David, David writes this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. What, what David was doing is he's inviting the Lord to be that one who would search him and to prove him and to know him and to, to help him to see if there was something in him that was going to lead him away to wickedness. And something in his heart that maybe is just beginning stages and early stages, but it needed to be addressed so that he could go in the way everlasting. And David asked the Lord to do that. And maybe we're a bit scared to do that, to genuinely ask the Lord to search us and to try us. And uh, if you do it, the Lord probably will show you. And if you ask him, Lord, is there anything between me and you? Is there any sin? Is there any unconfessed sin? Is there something that's hindering our fellowship? 
most probably he'll bring something to your attention. And you better just be willing and I better be willing to confess that and forsake it so that I can have mercy, so you can have mercy. Amen. So we just need to know the state of our hearts. Um, second of all, I'd like to uh, notice a few examples in Scripture. Come with me to Genesis chapter 43. Genesis chapter 43. Knowing the state, Genesis chapter 43. Familiar story here of Joseph being sold into slavery in Egypt by his brethren. And then they had essentially presented falsehood to their dad and said, well, a wild beast has evidently killed him. And so their dad gave up hope that Joseph was alive and basically assigned Joseph to the grave. The, uh, the famine comes into the, to the land and they run out of food. And so they go down into Egypt because God had used Joseph to provide food for his people. And God had set that up in advance of time. Um, those, those brethren thought evil. God meant it unto much good to save many souls alive as it is that day. And the brethren come to Joseph and they, they're asking for food. And, and what does Joseph do? Genesis 43 and verse number 7. They, they come back to their dad and they report what happened. They said, verse 7, The man asked us straightly of our state and of our kindred, saying, Is your father yet alive? Have ye another brother? And we told him according to the tenor of these words, could we certainly know that he would say, bring your brother down? We're reading in chapter 43, they'd already been up to, across to Egypt and they'd seen Joseph and, and this is the questioning that Joseph had given to them. Is your father yet alive? Do you have another brother? What's Joseph doing? He's inquiring of their state. He's trying to understand their condition. He hadn't seen his dad for so long. He loves his dad. He wants to know if his dad's yet alive. Now, they don't know that, and they will know that later on. But at this point, all they know is that the ruler of Egypt is asking us straightly of our state. In fact, I think what Joseph wanted to achieve with this ultimately was he wanted those brethren to come face to face with their true state. And, and you see back in chapter 42 how they responded to those questions. Verse 21, Genesis 42, verse 21. This is what they say one to another. They said one to another, we are verily guilty concerning our brother. They're speaking of Joseph here. In that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. And Reuben answered them saying, spake I not unto you saying, do not sin against the child and you would not hear. Therefore behold, also his blood is required. And they knew not that Joseph understood them, for he spake unto them by an interpreter. So they're having this conversation in Joseph's presence, but they're obviously speaking in their own tongue, Hebrew, and they don't think that Joseph can understand. But what they've just revealed is this, that something's in their heart and it's pricking them. And they've never really been able to clear their conscience of that matter. And it's coming out now, isn't it? Because they're in this situation where if they don't give Simeon their brother to be a guarantee back in prison in Egypt, then they will not come back to Joseph one day. So these men need food. Their families need food. The only way for them to get food and survive is leave their brother Simeon in the land in prison. They go back to their father and they eat that food and then they come back, but they have to bring the younger brother with them. And this question of Joseph about their state is prompting them to think, well, man, we, we really shouldn't have done this, prop, this, this matter regarding our brother. We're verily guilty concerning our brother. That's what they never really accepted until now, I think. And they, they'd hidden it and they'd tried to deal with it and move on. But the guilt was there and they knew it. And Joseph's questioning is bringing that out. Come with me to the New Testament, um, Philippians chapter 2. We're looking at examples of knowing the state. Philippians chapter 2. There's a couple of examples where the Apostle Paul had a genuine concern to know the state of believers. Philippians chapter 2, verse 19. If you think back to the establishment of the church at Philippi, it was a fairly, fairly dramatic, fairly short event. You know, they, 
come to Philippi after seeking the mind of the Lord and God had said to them, the Holy Spirit had said, no, you're not going to go here or here or here. And they saw a vision and this man asks them to come over and help, help us. And, and so they do and they go into Philippi and they meet down by the riverside and they meet that lady and Lydia and she, she gets saved and um, they, they, re- they receive Paul and his team into her house and look after him. But then there's this opposition with that girl that's possessed with the spirit of divination and Ultimately, Paul and Silas are thrown into prison, having been beat with many stripes. And God uses that time to bring the jailer to Christ. And soon after that, they depart from Philippi and they go on. So now Paul is writing back to the church at Philippi and hasn't seen them. And he says this in verse 19. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But ye know the proof of him, that as a son with the Father, he hath served with me in the gospel. Him, therefore, I hope to send presently, so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. But I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. What's Paul trying to do here? He wants to know how these brethren that only just got saved, and pretty much after getting saved, he had to leave them. And he, he's obviously praying for them and Holy Spirit's clearly doing a work there. But Paul doesn't know their state. You can't just get on a phone and, and text them. Hey, hey, brethren, how are you? How's things going? You can't do a live stream. You can't do a video call. It's, it's, a, it's a world where time makes a big... Uh, location is, is a huge, huge impediment to communication. And Paul said, I, I want to know your state. So I'm going to send Timothy. Timothy's going to go and he cares for your state naturally. He's like-minded like me, and he's going to inquire about that. And he's going to bring me word about your state, and it's going to be of comfort to me. So this is, this is Paul caring about the state of those at Philippi. And then we see a similar example in 1 Thessalonians, if you'll come back with me there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Paul once again caring about how the believers are doing. Just keeping that thing in mind that, you know, he didn't really dwell long in the same city for, for a great amount of time preaching and teaching. And really, he, he preached, preached the gospel. Maybe it was a week, maybe two weeks, three weeks, maybe a month. In some cases, months, many months. But oftentimes, Paul would have to move on quickly. And he would have to commit them to the scripture that they had, the, the word of God that they had. The Old Testament, obviously, is given to them at that point. And they could preach Christ from that. But they, they didn't have the privileges that we have, really, of someone just there steadily. So he would, he would appoint men, elders, and set them over the congregation. He'd go to the next town and start the next work. And so in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, sorry, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Did I say chapter 5? 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. I was looking at that. It wasn't making any sense. Verse 5. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear... I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. Back in chapter 2, we can read about how Paul just greatly longed to know how these believers at Thessalonica were doing. They, they had tried to make an attempt to see their face, but Satan had hindered them from coming. And so at a point where they could no longer forbear, they sent Timothy to establish them and comfort them. And he wanted to know their faith. Have the believers at Thessalonica departed from the faith? Have the tribulations and afflictions that he had spoken about moved them? He wanted to find out how they're doing. How was the state, how was the faith of these brethren at Thessalonica? And so, verse 6, Now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings, good news of your faith and charity, and that you have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted. It was a great comfort to Paul to find out that those believers at Thessalonica, they'd stuck with the faith. And they'd been faithful, even though there had been affliction and distress. And so, we see this example here of Paul wanting to know how these believers are going, Philippi and Thessalonica. 
without spending the time just to quickly mention that Paul wanted the believers also to know how his state was. And you can read about that in Ephesians chapter 6, 21 and 22, and Colossians chapter 4, verses 7 to 9, how that he wanted the brethren to understand his state. They could understand how to pray for him. They could understand how to help him and, and, and so forth. So this matter of knowing the state, I can see some examples in the Bible. But I'd like to just do this thirdly before we wrap up is I'd like to switch gears a little bit and I'd like you to consider this morning what is man, every man, at his best state? You take man and you put him at his best state and you do that for every one of them. What is that? Well, the Bible gives us the answer. Come with me to Psalm chapter 39. Psalm chapter 39. We have to recognize that we need an authority and we need the scriptures as our final authority. And uh, if the Bible says it's so, then it is so. Psalm 39. This is a psalm of David. You can read that in the title. What does he say in verse number 4? Psalm 39, verse 4. Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days what it is that I may know how frail I am. He was inviting the Lord to help him to understand something. Verse 5, Behold, thou hast made my days as an handbreadth, and mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. And the word selah is right there. Think about that. Every man at his best state, is altogether vanity. The Bible uses one word to describe man at his best state, and it's this word called vanity. But not just the word vanity. He says verily or truly. He's putting emphasis on this. Every man at his best state, verily. And then he also says this, altogether. Altogether vanity. What is vanity? Vanity is emptiness. Every man at his best state is altogether, truly, emptiness. You take a man at his best state. Uh, We might think about someone in great authority, great influence, great power, great riches, maybe great health. You could look at any number of factors, and the Bible says about that man, verily, altogether, vanity. That's what the Bible says. Emptiness. The, the scriptures tell us that our life is a vapor. In James, we read that we know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. You boil the kettle this morning and you see that steam rising up from the kettle. The Bible says that's your life. It's there for a little bit and then it's, it's gone. That's our life. In fact, we are given... Um, scripture that gives us a general expectancy of how long we can live. In Psalm chapter 90, verse 10, the days of our years are three score years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Three score and ten, that's three. Uh, three is obviously three. Score is 20. Three times 20 is 60 plus 10, that's 70 years. The Bible says the days of our years are three score years and ten. 70 years. Now, thankfully, there's some of us here that are older than 70 this morning, I believe. And so the Lord's been good and merciful. But the Bible says that even if you got to 80 years, yet is there strength, labor, and sorrow. Life is so short. The Bible um, told us how man became a living soul in Genesis chapter 2. God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. What happened to man? Man, who was formed out of the dust of the ground, became a living soul. Now, go to Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, and the Bible says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. That's what happens when you die. This, this, this mortal flesh, this dust, it goes back to the ground. That's all we are. We're... Um, 
we're made of the dust of the earth. And when, when God takes away that life, or when that life ends, then the, the dust goes back. And what happens to the spirit? The spirit returns to God who gave it. That's that breath that he breathed, that inspiration. So why are we talking about this? Because man at his best state is altogether vanity because of how short his life is, how empty his life is. In Psalm 39, if you're still there, the Bible says, Behold, thou hast made my days as an hand breadth. You take your hand and you look at the, the breadth of it, that's, that's your days, that's your hand. That's how, that's how long your life is. And our ages is nothing before the Lord. So if your life is going to be that short, the Bible says it's vanity. Well, why? why? Why are we limited so much? Why is our life vain? Well, because of sin. And I'd like to talk about the cause of this, of this death, which is sin. Uh, the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse number 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, that all have sinned. Man was not made to die, but sin brought death. The Garden of Eden, Adam chooses to not believe the Lord, chooses to believe the devil, and follow his wife, and they eat that fruit. And God had said that in the day that they eat thereof, they would surely die. They didn't just drop dead physically right then. But what was broken was their fellowship with the Lord and their separation from the Lord was, was created. And every human that ever came into this world after Adam is born spiritually dead. Because the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, you hath he quickened or made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Someone that's physically dead can't get saved. So we're talking about people that are living and breathing. And the Bible says, you who were dead in trespasses and sins have been made alive through Jesus Christ. So there's a birth that takes place. But we have to understand that sin entered the world through Adam. And death came by sin. And the wages of sin is death. So we've all inherited that sin nature and we've all chosen to sin, haven't we? No one needs to teach us how to do the wrong thing. So what happens after death? If our lives are that empty and that short and our days are as a handbreadth, then what happens when we die? Well, we read in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, Then shall the dust return unto the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. But there is something after death. Hebrews 9 verse 27 says, as it is appointed unto men once to die. And so many people say that that's it, that life ends. You just go to the grave and life is over. But not so. That's why we come back to the scriptures as our final authority. The Bible says, as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, after death, the judgment. Amen. There could be someone here today who is not ready to face that judgment. That judgment is clearly told about in Revelation chapter 20, if you'd like to turn over there. Revelation chapter 20, we are told who will preside over that judgment and what will happen at that judgment. I'm sure that most of us have probably heard of a court case or maybe in history we've read something where judgment was, where justice was not given. Someone executed judgment, but it wasn't, wasn't done rightly and all it takes is a corrupt judge for that to happen and it so easily happens in our society doesn't it um, and it's frustrating and it's difficult when judgment is not executed properly but we're talking about someone who is going to know everything and who is holy and who will not overlook sin and who cannot be bribed or motivated through money we're talking about the holy almighty lord god He's the one who's sitting in judgment on that day. Revelation chapter 20, verse number 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Hold on, I thought when you died, you died. That was it. That's not true. When you die, there's a judgment coming. If you're not saved, you will come to this judgment. The Bible says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. Notice the plural there. The books were opened. 
And we'll read about what's in those books in a second. The books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. What we have is a scene being played out here is that the great God, the judge of all the earth, he will do right. And he sees everything. In fact, he doesn't just see what we do, but he sees what we think before we do it. He sees what we would do if we could do it. He knows the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And he keeps record of those, of those things, those thoughts, those motives, those actions, those words. And unless we are saved through the precious blood of Jesus Christ before this life is over, then we have to go to this judgment. And we have to stand before this judge and he will open the books. And in those books will be written all the works that we did, which would be worthy of judgment. The Bible says the dead were judged on what basis? Out of, the, out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And there's a lot of people going around trying to do the right thing and trying to live a good life. And I'm glad you do that. It's good to live decent and clean and be an honorable citizen. That's a good thing, but it will not take you to heaven. So many people pass us by on the street ministry and they say, oh, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Nothing could be further from the truth. There is none good, the Bible says. No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. In fact, all of our righteousness are as filthy rags. And the Bible does say here that we are judged, those that are there are judged out of those things which were written in the books. And that's a scary thought. If I kept a record of all the sins I'd ever committed, I don't think I could finish that book. And I think if you're honest, you probably couldn't do the same. And, and we tend to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. So God, who knows our hearts, who made us, who created us, who can search us and try us properly and do that for all the people in this world, he will write an accurate book. He's not going to let things go. He won't brush by a white lie or a little sin. God looks at everything we do. So those that are standing at this judgment are judged out of those things written in the books according to their works. What happens to the sea and death and hell? Well, verse 13, the sea gave up the dead which were in it. So if you, I guess this is for those who died at sea. Uh, the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. So everyone that's in the sea and death and hell stand at this judgment. Every man according to their works. What is, what is the conclusion of verse 14? Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Verse 15, some of the most awful words of Scripture and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Uh, yesterday, I spoke to someone who knew Brother Warren on the street. And I said to him, how did you know him? And uh, he said, well, you know, he, he was the jockey for my grandfather's horse. And of course, um, we know that Brother Warren did ride horses and was a jockey before he got saved. And uh, this man told me, he said... But I said to him, did Brother Warren ever share the gospel with you? Because if you knew Brother Warren, you couldn't know him for that long before he would tell you about Jesus Christ and how you could be saved. And I asked him, did you get the gospel from Brother Warren? He said, of course. And he said, but I could never get past this fact that he told me that there was a lake of fire and that you would go into that lake of fire when you died if you weren't saved. And he didn't think that God could really do that. That God would really just judge someone by putting them in the lake of fire. And he as far as I know, he probably didn't accept what Warren told him. So the Lord gave him another opportunity yesterday, praise the Lord. But the point is this, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. God, God keeps the books of the works and then he keeps another book, the book of life. And there are names written in that book and there are some names that are not written in that book. And the only way to get written in that book is to be saved. We speak of salvation. We're talking about a spiritual birth, something that you cannot physically see. But you will not be in the book of life if you reject the Lord Jesus Christ. 
if you say that you're good enough, if you say that I'm a clean person, I'm happy to come to church today and listen to you preach, but I'm going to go and do my own thing and I'm not going to be responsible to God. Well, God has an answer here. If you're not found written in the book of life, you're cast into the lake of fire. And that's the conclusion of the matter. Not death in the first time, but we're talking about death the second time. And there's no coming back from the second death. We're talking about second death in the lake of fire for all of eternity. How could God do that? Brother John, thank you for what you said yesterday. The fact that God could do that is because he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins according to the scriptures and to pay a horrible price for our sin. The Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. God's without excuse. He's given us his perfect only begotten son. He sent him into this world. He became sin for us who knew no sin so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. But we might. Not everyone will. And the Bible says that the gospel is quite plain, that Jesus Christ died on the cross according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And Jesus told Nicodemus, Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. And Nicodemus says, well, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And, and Jesus told him that this birth is not a physical birth like the natural birth. It is a spiritual birth that takes place. And it takes place when you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you go to John chapter 3, we see that the way to be born again is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, there's no physical activity that you can do to be born again. John chapter 3. Look at verse number 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. And then come down with me to verse number 14. Jesus said this, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Did you see any work in that verse? Did you see any activity other than simple belief in the Lord Jesus Christ? Yeah. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, the Bible says. And that's exactly what we must do if we wish to have everlasting life. John 3.16, you know this verse well. For God so loved the world. God so loved the world. He did something. He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God didn't send His Son to condemn the world. God sent His Son to seek and to save that which was lost. He gave a way of escape. The way is the cross. The way is Jesus Christ. And most of you, I believe, are saved this morning, but there might be someone sitting here and, and you need to be born again. And you must be born again through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other way. But it starts with recognizing your state, that you have a sin problem, that your sin problem will send you to hell for all of eternity, and that the only way, truth, and life is found in Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says. We're not ashamed to say that because, again, we need an authority and it's got to be the scriptures, right? Amen. Or it's my opinion, your opinion, and we've got a mess. So i just like to say this. As you consider man at his best state, man at his best state is altogether vanity. Life is so short. That's why it's so important to make sure that you have eternal life. And the only way to have eternal life is through Jesus Christ. Christian, it might be that the Lord has something it, that he wants to help you to see in your heart. There might be some matter that it's just between you and him. You don't need to go telling everyone else. You just need to confess it before the Lord. I, I don't know your hearts. I, I don't need to know your hearts. I don't want to know your heart. But I want you to do this. Is just be willing to ask the Lord to search you. Be willing to ask the Lord to help you to see what is the state of your heart. We'll have all um, heads bowed and eyes closed and we'll just take this time and as the pianist comes. And Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to... Uh, look at your word this morning, just a very simple thought, and um, I don't know who all are here and where they stand before you, but believe this is the message that needed to be preached, and we'd like to ask God that if there's somebody here this morning who is not saved, um, somebody who doesn't know you, 
as their personal Savior, that today might be that day that the light would come on, they'd see and understand their need of Jesus Christ. And they'd stop trying in their own good works to get themselves to heaven. And Lord, I pray that you would help them to believe on the Lord. And if there's a Christian here, Father, this morning that needs to just do a bit of a health check, as it were, and ask you, Lord, about the state of their heart, Father, I pray they'd be willing and honest to do that. And that if you show them something, that they'd have the grace to confess it, turn from it, and have your mercy. We pray it in Jesus' name. If you'll stand with me, we'll have heads.